While our catalogs are filled with such impressive examples of artwork, these are a few memorable highlights that really stood out to our team. It's a great honor for Heffel to be offering this gorgeous Chris Ophelia canvas, who is considered one of the world's most important contemporary artists working today. Chris Ophelia emerged from the Young British Artist Movement in the 1990s and became famous for his large, intricate mixed media paintings, famously incorporating elephant dung as a material into the surface, while still creating these rich, beautiful, surfaces. In 1998, at the age of 30, Chris Ophelia became the first black artist to receive the Turner Prize and he represented Britain at the 2003 Venice Biennale. In 2005, Chris moved to the island of Trinidad with his family where he and his close friend Peter Doig would often visit and paint together. This move was an effort to get away from the commercialism and hype of the art world and return to a more direct engagement with his painting craft. And what resulted from this self-imposed art world exile was a series of darkly lit, rich, monochromatic blue paintings, which were inspired by the landscape of Trinidad and are rich with symbolism and myth. While it's a complex layer of illusions, it is at its heart a beautiful painting and is an example of an of one of the world's greatest painters painting at the height of his powers. August C number five is a masterpiece by Robert Motherwell that embodies a beautiful melding of two of the artist's most famous series, the Beside the Sea series and the Open series. The work leads the Joan Stewart Clark collection. This extraordinary canvas, in fact, was one of Joan, Joan Clark's first major purchases. Robert Motherwell was one of the giants of abstract expressionism, the New York School. He was one of the youngest members of the abstract expressionists and also one of the most well-educated, having gone to Stanford University, Harvard University, and Columbia University. Robert Motherwell spent his summers in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and in his writing, he talked about the August blue in the sky. This painting is evocative of many people's experience of intense color of blue in the sky and the intense color and movement around water and the ocean and to this universal beauty in nature. In this painting, I see the infinite possibilities of abstraction, which is something Motherwell would have been attunedly aware to. The black horizontal line and the vertical line creates this tension in the work with the acrylic on canvas, but there's charcoal as, as well, and so there's tension between abstraction and representation. So I really wanted to highlight this painting from McEwen from the 1960s. At the time McEwen was painting this work, he had sort of abandoned the early influences of Riappel and the American abstract expressionists that he had met in Paris, and then he was busy establishing his own particular language of abstraction. So he had stopped using a palette knife and was applying paint directly with his hands, or pouring it directly into the canvas, building out these very textured, tactile surfaces. They're still very soft and very liquid. Important to McEwen's work is his use of color, and I think this is a really fantastic example of that. Um, he uses these very bold reds and ochres, um, but closer examination shows use of whites and blacks and even these very deeper blues, so it creates a very sort of elemental sense of turbulence to the piece. I picked this Kragoff behind me as one of my personal favorites in this auction. Uh, Kragoff, if you go through our Canadian art history books, is often referred to as Canada's first professional artist. For over a century and a half, Kragoff has been collected by royalty by lords, by commanders of military, captains of industry, and passionate collectors. It's the provincial subject matter of this Kragoff that makes it so special to me. I had the experience this last February to cross the frozen St. Lawrence on an icy day of minus 30 in the sunshine, and the, you realize how dangerous it is. Kragoff painted in a sophisticated ma manner using glazing. Uh, he would apply layers of varnish 
and then layers of highlight paint on top of that varnish, and then another layer of varnish and more highlights, often leaving his red highlights to the last uh, coat of glazing. Over the years, many Pragoffs have been cleaned or restored, and improperly, uh, often those highlights, particularly the reds, can be lost. This is a, a masterpiece. It's in phenomenal condition, but what it makes it so bright and dynamic and vibrant are the fact that those highlights are preserved. Heffel is honored to bring this Craigoff to the market. It has fabulous provenance. It's in great condition, and it's truly one of the finest examples of this work. Heffel is honored to offer the spectacular 1953 Jean-Paul Riappel Sans Titre. Painted during his most acclaimed period, Sans Titre is as good as a Riappel composition gets. It is a vibrant, balanced, and commanding canvas, which displays Riappel's famous drip and palette knife technique. Along with creating arguably his best quality of work, there was a lot happening in Riappel's life around the time he created Sans Titre. He left Quebec and his artist group, Les Automatis, to move to France, where he became part of the Surrealist Circle. It was in Paris in the 1950s that Riappel developed this mosaic style that we see in Sans Titre. The same year Sans Titre was painted, the famous art dealer, Pierre Matisse, son of the artist Henri Matisse, took on Riappel as an artist. And the year after that, Riappel had his first solo exhibition at the Pierre Matisse Gallery. I really love viewing this painting from afar and then walking closer to see every drip, stroke, and color that makes up the composition. This painting is really mesmerizing. I could stare at it all day long. Twenty twenty one was a record breaking year for Doris McCarthy's work at auction, and Heffel is so thrilled to have two fantastic canvases in our spring sale this year. Doris McCarthy was an ambitious traveler, and she had a passionate appreciation for the landscape. She traveled to the Arctic many times in the later decades of her life, and made a final trip in two thousand and four when the artist was nearly ninety four years old. Late Light Broughton Island is a stunning Arctic landscape painted by McCarthy in nineteen eighty two. What is most striking to me about the painting is the awe-inspiring sense of scale McCarthy has created. The icy formations in the foreground, rendered in crisp blues, whites, and turquoises, are mirrored in the expanse of purple mountains farther afield. The scene is both jaw-dropping and calming at the same time, a sublime experience in the landscape. One of my favorite works in this season's sale is the very important early Alexander Coville painting, Coastal Figure. Coville's works really came to prominence in the 1950s. He revived figurative painting during the post-war period when abstraction was gaining importance, and this was only a few years after he returned from World War II. In this work, a woman lies on the shoreline, gazing longingly at nature, yet she seems to be at one with it. She is contemplative as she rediscovers peace, like many were trying to do during the post-war era. In Dr. Mark Cheatham's essay in the auction catalog, he compares the scooped out shoreline at the top left of the picture with the soft curves of the woman's back. And it's those subtle geometric schemes that Coville uses to control how the viewer observes his seemingly perfect static composition. We are thrilled this season to be offering the magnificent canvas, Singing Trees. The catalog essay by Gerda Murray is certainly well worth the read, but there are a few key ideas that really resonated with me. The first idea is how Emily Carr really harkens back to her French training in this painting. And we see that through the use of the indigos, mauves, violets that she uses, predominantly in sort of the upper half of the composition. Second is the notion of the tree as standing in for the idea of the human experience. Just seeing these young trees in the foreground juxtaposed against the more mature trees in the background, which protect them, struck a real familial note with me. And Carr herself writes, in the forest, think not of this tree or that, but of the singing movement of the whole. This concept seems to pervade in much of Carr's work, and the concept sort of leads me into another personal favorite of mine, which is the Cliwick orca platter. The whale, too, can be considered a symbol of a much larger oceanic environment as a whole. 
Last fall, when Heffel put together the World of Emily Carr specialty sale, we consigned several wonderful ceramics from Kate Mather's collection, but intentionally held this work back for spring. So this example with its impressive size, its impeccable provenance as I've just described, as well as sort of that rarity of the killer whale motif, is a trifecta that uh, I do wonder if we will see again in a ceramic, so I am very excited to see what Auction Night has in store for it. Rita Latondra's 1960s Reflet de Aden is truly a masterpiece. I feel that at the very core, this painting is about energies, and I think that's why its impact is so profound. The energy that this painting radiates is the product of Latondra's masterful understanding of the capacity of color and its technical application, both in its use and in its absence. We see these great swaths of thick black impasto paired harmoniously alongside a rich dark green. The composition is then ignited by bursts of white and flashes of electric blue and orange. This painting also brings to mind the energy of Latondra herself, both intellectual and physical. I can't help but think about Latondra working on this large canvas, the physicality of the act of painting and the traces that each of her movements, you know, her own energy, left on the canvas. I remember the first time I stood in front of this work, it felt like witnessing flashes of lightning in a moody thunderstorm. Even more deeply, a moment of illumination, the grand cosmic energy of nature, a moment of creation in and of itself. Hughes began his career as a commercial artist. At the start of World War II, he enlisted as an official wartime artist. This was the first time in his career he was able to devote himself fully to his art. Following the war, he returned to Canada and he began his remarkable series of coastal British Columbia. Low Tide Qualicum Beach is from Hughes' highly sought after late 1940s time period. The dates on the back of the work span a period of seven months, demonstrating the careful consideration Hughes took while creating this work. Every aspect of the work has been meticulously considered, from the organization and composition. There is a rhythm in the ordering of the work, ranging from the juxtaposition of dark and light, the positioning of the figures, and the patterns in the water's surface. But what I think really makes Hughes' work so special is the emotional connection that viewers are able to make with his works. In Church at Qualcomm Beach, we see that Hughes was also a master of the watercolor medium. In the watercolor, we see the same exacting consideration as with the oil painting. Hughes captured the peace and beauty of the countryside around Qualicum Beach in his depiction of the church and the two people walking up the shadowed road. Both of these works, while in different mediums, demonstrate Hughes' masterful technical abilities. There are two works in the sale that do a really fantastic job of explaining the journey that Lauren Harris went on as an artist. The first is Snow in the Woods Algonquin Park One, painted around 1915. First of all, it's a very rare painting. There are very few known examples of Harris painting in Algonquin Park. But what I really enjoy about this painting is it shows Harris as a romantic painter. There is a sense of gesture and texture, an impressionist feel but also a real poetic sense of an artist being inspired by nature. And you take that and you contrast it to Mountain Sketch 1928. At this point in Harris's life, he had adopted a much more minimal, much more idealized style. He was still painting from nature, but essentially over these 10 years, he had journeyed from an artist who was inspired by nature to an artist who was attempting to express the state of inspiration itself. And that's a really fascinating thing to see. 